Welcome fans to a special French Open edition of Changeover Chat presented by Sportmaster Sports Surfaces. I'm your host Randy Master. Today's guest joining us for the 63rd episode from Paris is Christopher Clary of the New York Times. You can see he's right there on site. It's about what, midnight there, Chris? Yeah, it's not a lot of clay in this room, but uh, <laughs> or otherwise, but yeah, we're over <laughs> This is a vast media room here at the Roland Garros. It was built a couple of years ago. And right now, and most of the day really is pretty empty. Aren't there aren't that many reporters here this year because of pandemic restrictions and because of uh, the time we're at right now. I mean, most, most of the day, the day is now done. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it might be nice for you to be back in your element and back in Paris covering a Grand Slam. Yeah. Live tennis, Randy. It's, that's the nicest thing. I mean, I've really missed that. I mean, I've watched so much tennis, obviously, the last year and a half. But uh, it's great to see the, the shots in person and you know, feel the uh, the power of the strokes and to, yeah. uh, sense the movement of the, of the players and all that in, in person. That that's as a tennis you know geek or a tennis reporter, that's what you miss. And then what about these night session matches? Brand new at Roland Garros, you've been able to watch. I'm sure the matches from a press area. Obviously, there are no fans that are being let in. Is this a little bit of a uh, a strange feeling to see night matches at Roland Garros that are actually scheduled night matches. Well, first of all, I got to say one thing that is that there's a, an old friend of mine named Tom Tebbett, who is Canada's leading tennis writer for many years. Great guy. And he and I have been came to Roland Garros together for over two decades. We both vowed that when Roland Garros put night sessions in place, we'd be done by then. Well, Tom's gone. He's, he's taking a break now, but I'm still here. So I'm not a man of my word, obviously, because here I am. Right. I never imagined you would see night sessions in in Paris, first of all, and definitely not without any fans. So it's it's been a, a very strange thing to be in there with these great matchups and these big stars and, and nobody there. Obviously, you had that at the U.S. Open and other tournaments. But yeah, you now the rest of the day here with 5000 people in the stands or in the on the grounds anyway, you, you get some atmosphere. But these big yeah. ticket matchups like tomorrow, they've got Nadal versus Gasquet which would normally be a packed match, even though, you know, it seems like it's a predestined outcome with Nadal's record against Gasquet, but Frenchman and, and the 13 time champ, but it'll be, you know, nobody in there except the officials. Yeah. seems like they play every tournament or at least when Gasquet's healthy and Rafa's healthy. <laughs> They've been playing since they were 10. I've seen yeah, video. Not to Gasquet's <laughs> benefit since the very early years. <laughs> right. Right. So this tournament, obviously Chris um, has been mired with uh, controversy Due to the Naomi Osaka situation, she announces uh, by social media before the event that she wasn't going to do any press. She blamed it on, and she didn't go into too much detail, but she said she mentioned her mental health, that people, I guess that means the media have no regard for mental health. She didn't want to be around people that doubted her. Um, she said that the media kind of kicks athletes when they're down, what was your immediate reaction? And dude, I would think as a reporter and somebody that's been re reporting on tennis for so many years, weren't you a little bit offended by what she said in social media? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't get offended. I mean, I, but I was surprised yeah. in the sense that, uh, and I was on the plane when I came from uh, Boston to Paris to cover the tournament. And I arrived and I was shocked by what I saw. It really came out of the blue. I mean, Naomi's had her struggles on the court you know, since winning the Australian Open, hasn't had some great results since she's come back. And, but I've always been, found her relationship with the press to be pretty positive in a lot of ways. There've been some moments, Wimbledon uh, press conference when she left and some things that have been difficult through the years, a few tears and some issues, but generally she's had a very, uh, I think cordial, and I think uh, the press really appreciates her yeah. authenticity and her, and her approach to things. So it really surprised me to see this come out of, and I think it surprised not only me, but the people who really matter, that's the officials. Uh, here at the sure. tournament, I'm caught by surprise by it, and that was, I think, probably the biggest problem with it is that she put this out there without a whole lot of um, advanced vetting, and I think she caught the whole institution of Grand Slam tennis by surprise, and it created a lot of misunderstandings. And I think, you know, if she had made it clear, you may get into this with your next question, Randy. I don't know, but if she made it much clearer from the beginning to people who really mattered behind the scenes what was going on here, uh, what she later made clear. Um, a lot of this wouldn't have happened, I think. Well, that was my, yeah, it was my follow-up question. I mean, first of all, when you see it and then you see the reaction to it, you're like, couldn't Naomi have just done this behind the scenes with the FFT and 
I, you know, ultimately, I guess it would have come out that she didn't want to do media or whatever. She wasn't going to show up at her first press conference, so she would have gotten fined 15 grand. But wasn't there a better way for her to have kind of released this information? It just seemed um, she just put it out there for the entire world to see that she was skipping. So that's the first question. Did it even need to get out there to begin with? Could she have just started skipping them? You know, that's a good question. I, there were there are many other solutions, and, and certainly, almost every way you can imagine of trying to go at this would, would involve a lot of communication. I mean, if she has an issue with uh, managing, you know, genuine depression or or real strong anxiety, and I'm no psychologist. I've talked to a lot this week, yeah. but I'm no <laughs> psychologist. I I think the sport could have come up with some pretty good solutions, and, and I'm going to give WTA some credit here. They this is not a uh, their first rodeo. They've gone through some yeah. difficult things, and they've made a lot of efforts to uh, put things in place to uh, to manage um, their players' mental health issues on tour. There's a their programs in place, and I've heard players this week talk about you know seeking help from those um, yeah those uh, people who work for the WTA or the tours to and they've gotten help from. And I'm not sure Naomi has tapped into that or not, but I I just know that to come into the situation and create an environment where people don't really know what's going on and you put this thing out in a massively public way and you're one of the, you're one of the world's biggest sports stars um, so emblematic right now for all kinds of right reasons it's just uh, it was really unfortunate and, I, and I've really never seen anything quite like it I would say yeah. in my long career where that this thing just exploded like that there have been plenty, plenty of incidents in tennis just think about the last three or four years with yeah this, you know Osaka US Open final and the uh, Novak Djokovic default at the U.S. Open last year. These things take over for news cycles as they should. But this was really a, seemed more like a self-inflicted sort of thing in a lot of ways. Yeah. The sport wasn't given a chance to manage it properly. And, and I'm not saying that the administrators are not at fault to some degree. They could have maybe, you know, that's, that could be another thing we talk about what, how they handled it. But I feel like there was a much better way to do this. Well, I felt like there was a part of the story that I may have missed or others that were just following it um, in the social realm or reading, you've written a lot or a couple of articles on it. They come down with this very harsh message, messaging, penalty. You know, you, we might dismiss you from this tournament. You might, you're gonna get fined in the other slams. You could face expulsion, like all of these really, really nasty kind of threatening comments. Um, now, do you think that was brought on just by the fact that the FFT had reached out to her and apparently there was no answer? She just didn't give any explanation on her first statement. It, it just seems like there must have been more to that for them to just come out and just, you know, lay salt in the wound. Would mm -hmm. you say so? Well, I, it, was, it was a very hard line. And I, I'm, I'm not privy to all the details from my reporting. I can just tell you that I know there were efforts made to reach out to her directly. She did write them an email of some sort or a message to say, say that she wanted to talk about it after the fact, uh, after the tournament, and that she uh, didn't mean anything personally to the French Open. But she didn't really resolve some of their, their questions and concerns, and nor, did, nor were they clear, from what I understand, on you know, just how much she has been suffering from these mental health issues. And I don't think um, they were aware of the depth of the problem. So I think all that created a situation where they felt they needed to send her a strong message. And the second part of it is it's a much bigger topic and a much bigger discussion. But I think they were concerned that if they let Osaka kind of dictate the terms of how she was going to deal with the press, it's going to open the floodgates to all the other stars in the game to sort of do the same thing and and stop going directly and start going directly to their public through their social media accounts, which is yeah. the way a lot of things are going in sports and entertainment and everything else, and sort of break down this model. And I think that was that was a lot of the concern. But the, the core of it was really a lack of communication, I think, between Naomi and maybe her team and, and the people who were making the decisions. But I thought it was a, a really, knowing what we know now and what you're reading all these columns around the yeah. world the incident, the people who were you know, smart writers and good people, but that they're missing that step. They're judging the process from what we know now as opposed to what we knew three or four days ago when this, this all kind of exploded. So yeah. I think to be fair, you have to really keep that context in mind. Yeah, and I was listening to a little bit of Patrick McEnroe's podcast this morning. He had his brother John on, and John was sympathetic and mentioned, like a lot of people have, wanting to give her a big hug and applauding her for coming out. 
and talking about the issues that were really the serious mental health issues that were really um, confronting her, whether it was anxiety, depression, going back all the way to 2018. Uh, another person that said uh, she'd love to give Naomi a big hug is uh, none other than Serena Williams, who came out. And it was interesting. I wanted to talk about her comments and then Venus's comments and then have you respond. Um, Serena said she just has thick skin. Some people have thin skin. I don't know if she was referring to Naomi. I guess she was maybe not specifically. Um, and then Venus came out and made a comment. Uh, and we had talked about it. Interesting in our, our last interview about kind of the man in the arena um, question where uh, you would mention that Tom Watson at the Belfry when he was captain of the Ryder Cup had kind of given that same man in the arena, hey, you guys don't really know what you're talking about. Leave it to the experts. Mm -hmm. yep. And I felt like that was a little bit what Venus was saying. I don't know if it was kind of jokingly or not, but she's like, when I get up there, I know I'm a better tennis player than than everybody out there. What, how did that, and again, you don't you have to take some of this with a grain of salt, but I feel like the media, if people like you, and there's so many people that write about tennis and, uh, and do great work, I feel like you're being somewhat vilified. It's not like, it's not like Chris, you walk into a press conference every day and say, hey, I'm gonna, I am gonna absolutely slam her. I am gonna ask her the toughest questions and she's gonna be really upset when she leaves. Like, you guys don't think like that, or they're just some bad apples that <laughs> that do. Hey, you know, it's it's, it's a in someone like Venus's case. She's you know almost forty one years old and has been doing this since she was in her mid teens. So think about the arc of that, and she's yeah. she's seen a lot of that. And I've seen other athletes who've gone through that kind of a process, like a Navratilova, who remained throughout the whole endeavor. And she certainly had her challenges, you know, with her issues uh, with society and her identity and. And all her and her political changes and everything else, but she remained very interactive with the press all the way through her career, and and in some ways increasingly increasingly thoughtful as time went on. And that happens to a lot of athletes. And in the, in the rare case of Venus, who in my view is a bit more of a natural introvert in some ways, um, and so therefore this whole process may not be as pleasant for her as it is for some. She's kind of gradually, at least with the print media, glammed up over time. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that comment, I did read that. And to be 100% honest with you, it, it did make me a little bit, I wasn't offended, but it did make me a little bit sad to read that because I thought, you know, it didn't have to be this way that someone is as potentially thoughtful as Venus, who has so much to give to the, de the debate on a day-to-day -day basis, is just kind of pulled herself away from it all. Yeah. And if that's the way she was thinking about it, that, you know, people that are asking me questions essentially really are, that, that comment that she made about, you know, they'll never hold a can. She didn't say, she, she said, they'll never light a candle to me, but she meant they'll never hold a candle to me. Right, right. On tennis court, which is of course true, but that's been true of all these other champions over the years as well with the media that they're facing and that hasn't kept them from having a, a positive constructive exchange with them. So it's, it's sad to me that we've come to that, somebody like Venus. And, and yeah. I think, I think she meant it. I don't think it was a, it was in joke in a joking way at all. Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk about some of the other people swirling around uh, Naomi, let's talk about her handlers. Now, she makes more money than any female athlete in the world. I mean, she, she did like 10 deals in a row for like 55 million. Now, I would say, and, and I'm just speculating, and I might be wrong, I would say some of the blame should fall on her handlers, whether it's her agent or friends or boyfriend who have who have gotten her into this position where it's like, oh my God, I'm making 55 million bucks a year in endorsements. I sure as hell better stay at two, one, three in the world. And that adds more anxiety to her. So like if she has, and I don't doubt that she, she obviously has some serious mental issues that she needs to address. She said that, but do you think there are others that, I don't know if you call them enablers or ones that um, have, really contributed to this anxiety by making her such a big star commercially? You know, I got to be honest with you. I, I don't have an answer for you in terms of the details of that. I'm not privy to what goes on there. I, mean, I know her agent, Stuart. I've known him for a long time. And I, I know he's an experienced guy. Yeah. And he's a, and he has her best interests at heart. And he's done good work in the past. 
he may be in a situation where he's not being able to get his message across. I do not know. And yeah. I think it's, I'm not sure it's responsible for me as a journalist to speculate on that um, without having more information. But clearly whatever the message was from that team and Naomi, even at 23 is the head of that team. It did not effectively deal with this problem and avoid it becoming a major global right. media firestorm. <laughs> which it has <laughs> and, no. and ultimately I think everybody who's part of that team has to take a bit of responsibility for that. And frankly, everybody who's part of the, you know, the grand slam decision-making and French open decision-making teams has to take responsibility for that very hard line they took that uh, you know, in retrospect, I think they probably would soften knowing that knowing what they know now about the level of Naomi's uh, distress. Yeah. If, if we believe her and I choose to believe her, I mean, I think that's, you know, why shouldn't we? And I think it's uh, in some ways I talked to Jim Lair, who's a performance psychologist who's worked with um, Jim Currier, Monica Sellis and Novak Djokovic, very experienced guy yesterday. And, you know, he said it would actually be crazier if she didn't have problems based on yeah. all of changes that she's had in her life in the last three years. We, I just, we did a big piece on this today in the Times, New York Times about uh, just looking at the key events in Naomi's life over the last just three years and all the things she's been through, both by her own proactive behavior and just by things that have been imposed on her, like that crazy US Open final with Serena that was nothing to do with her. It was just the way it all played out with the empire. And, and, and she's had to cope with immense wealth, a lot of high profile, complex sorts of societal yeah which is at work and she's a, by her own description a natural introvert so even though she's quite thoughtful and i think has a capacity to really think on a different plane than a lot of people it's a lot to digest as jim lair said and, and I, I agree with him so it actually be more of a miracle i think if she didn't have some issues to deal with at this point knowing her personality knowing all she's going through and also knowing that she uh you know, in a social media age, and she's fairly active on her social media accounts. Yeah, you're going to be if you, if you can remove yourself from that, that's one thing. But most people who are in her generation cannot, and that that creates a whole level of scrutiny and feedback that those great champions in the past, the Chris Everts and Navratilovas and Billie Jean Kings and and John McEnroe's people like that, never had to deal with that. I just feel like uh, there really has to be uh, on both sides a look you know, an inquiry into why this happened. And let's yeah. be smart in the future. But I, I really feel if it had been clear from the start to people who mattered, it would have been a different outcome. Yeah. And just finally, before we start to talk, uh, I want to talk a little bit about tennis before I let you go. Um, it's, it just looks late. You don't look tight. You look good for being it's nice to say that you're lying, but it's nice to say. <laughs> that. Um, I think it's a, I think it's an opportunity for tennis and tennis obviously gets a lot of criticism here. It's like, good God, you know, how could you make a, uh, a mountain out of a molehill here? But tennis did, you can't really say tennis, but certain, um, you know, there's certain factions in the sport that led to this happening, but it's also an opportunity because now the tours can get together, the slams can get together and knowing what they know about Naomi, um, they can really help players and focus more on players, mental health, whatever that means, having an assigned number of psychologists on tour that are there for players at all time. And this isn't just the top stars that deal with all this anxiety. Imagine if you're not making any money and you're down at, you know, 200 in the world, just trying to survive. I mean, I think, um, and it's the male and the female side, what can the sport, I mean, you think the sport has an opportunity right now to really make a name for itself and uh, and almost going above and beyond as far as making sure that the player's uh, mental health is uh, is stable. Well, I think it's interesting. And again, I'm, I'm not privy to everything that the tour is doing behind the scenes at, the, at both tours, really. But it seems to me that in my time, the main focus, at least in a public manner, has been on the youngest players, the phenoms, the prodigies, the teens. You know, we started off in the early years of uh, the tour with some of the prodigies who came along who broke down physically and had some issues. And um, there was really an attempt to try to correct that and address that and put limits in place. I haven't heard as much about sort of the, the adult player, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and so what can be done for them? I'm sure there are resources in place, but maybe this situation with Naomi, who is 23 years old and an experienced player at this point, four-time Grand Slam champion, maybe this, this will, you know, give 
maybe a broader sense of this needs to be a full player population sort of approach. Yeah. And I think, you know, always proactivity is much better. And frankly, you know, I don't, people are, are, are lauding Naomi for her bravery and coming out and talking about her mental health issues. And that certainly is a good point to make, but I, I think it would have been, probably would have been much better if it hadn't been necessary for her to go public to make her point. I think it'd been sure. better if it remained for her well-being you know, probably behind the scenes. And that's probably the way she would have wanted it to be and, and preferred it to be. Yeah. Here it is now that it's come out into the public in this massive way. And she's not the only major athlete. Look at Michael Phelps, the swimmer who's talked about it. And yeah. Kevin Love, the NBA player, and, and several others who've taken that, you know, and pushed that idea out there and made it more um, palatable for athletes to be open about it. Then there needs to be a chance to use it in a positive way. And I, I'm, I'm sure Osaka will, will try to do that as well and we'll try to, use her, her profile in a way that will help bring some light to that. But the yeah. tour, they, need to, they need to do a better job of, of always of reaching out to all the players. And I, and I made this point today as well that on social media, and I really believe it. it. It's very important. And part of the reason this thing blew up, Randy, was because the tours were concerned about equity. And if they decided to let Naomi have a pass and they didn't realize how serious it potentially was, would that be fair to all the other players who had to come in and do press and go to the news conference and, and they're doing it because they were trying to respect the rules. So why give her a pass? Um, whatever they do now, it's important that they do the same thing for the lower ranked players that they're gonna do for the big stars. Yeah. Well, everybody, that's... everybody deserves an equal shot at, at mental health and, and resources and it shouldn't be in any way a, a star system. And there really shouldn't be any special dispensations given to players who are superstars that aren't given to other players too. So that's going to be the tricky thing. And that's why it will be tricky. Yeah. Well, very well said. And I want to uh, just quickly get to uh, Roland Garros. They're actually playing a tournament over there. If anyone, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone forgot, uh, yeah. there's been a lot of great tennis. Um, just quickly. I want to, I always start with the American men, John Feinstein, who, uh, who was on my show. Um, he, he's not afraid to, uh, he speak his mind. I don't know. You probably know John pretty I well. I sat between John Feinstein and Sally Jenkins. So that was my okay. introduction to Wimbledon, 19, 1990 Wimbledon. Yeah. Well, he, uh, John was on my show. This was a few months back, but um, didn't hold back in his view on American tennis these days on, on the men's side. Uh, he even went back to when Tim Wilkinson, Dr. Dirt made, I think he, I don't know. I think he was the only quarter finalist at the open. I don't remember one year, but he was talking about the fact that like everybody was in an uproar and how can this be the only American in the quarterfinals? And, you know, now John always uses that as, you know, we can't get an American male player into the second or third round of a slam. Now, that being said, so he just wrote a piece and kind of scathing. And I think some of the men, Maybe they didn't read it. Maybe they did. I think they may have heard about it. Who knows? But there are a couple of players making some noise over there. I mean, Tommy Paul, he played a great first set. He got shut down those last three. But we still have Riley hanging around, Taylor Fritz. Stevie Johnson won a big five-setter today. Marcus Giron. Uh, you have John Isner, who I'm not sure if you knew this. You probably do. He's one of the only guys to go five sets with Rafa at Roland Garros. Remember him. So he's, uh, he's got a shot. Um, and when I say a shot, I wanted to ask you which of these American players has a shot of maybe shutting Feinstein up, making a deep run. <laughs> and I know that this isn't the tournament that they would probably make a deep run, but they've looked pretty good so far. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, even when there were much higher ranked American men, the French Open was often, you know, the place where they all came to to go home early basically um you know even when we had top 10 guys like roddick and marty fish and players like that there was a lot of a lot of pain and misery for yeah. american parents now we're really we are at a low point i mean it's in terms we got three seated players but they're what 30 31 and 32 so we are not uh, where we have been by any means and, and uh, frankly not really where we should be but i do feel like there's this young generation of, of players coming through from the states who are going to do some damage sure and I was surprised that Sebastian Corda lost in the first round the way yeah. he did. I'm not sure he was really right in that match. Obviously, just come off winning a title in Parma. And to me, it looks like he's got a lot of really 
promising tools in his in his toolbox and looking forward to some good things from him. So there's, I think there's, there's some light on the horizon, but here, I mean, if the conditions are good, but the conditions could change, Randy, right now it's been a kind of a classic hard court kind of week here because it's been warm, sunny, pretty quick. Yeah. But people are saying the balls are going fast. Well, you hear about all that every year rolling grass, it's the same thing. It's the balls, the surface. A lot of it's weather, weather dependent on what kind of day you play. But now it's supposed to get heavier, a little bit more rain, a little more cloudy conditions. Conditions could slow down. Yeah. But I, I do feel like right now, looking at the way Opelka's playing, for example, and the results he's had on clay this year already a little bit, his kind of game, he's going to run into Medvedev now in the next round. Uh, you know, basically, if the conditions slow down, Medvedev starts to get frustrated, can't hit through the court. Bradley has yeah. a big serving day. You know, why not? And that section of the draw is with Medvedev not being a clay quarter, definitely is, is, is open. So I think Riley could be the guy to watch. Yeah. Taylor Fritz, Taylor Fritz has embraced the clay in a, in a lot of ways. And, and I think is a guy who's got a lot of upside, you know, could, could be a, definitely a top 20 player and maybe even a top 10 player. If he puts it all together, he's developing his skills and game. So, but to me, I'll be watching Riley and, and Isner obviously uh, has a very tough match because to me, it's just... all number one. And frankly, I, I put Sitsipas and Djokovic right together there at the number two spot. Obviously, Stefanos hasn't won a slam or even been to a final. So you, you have a hard time putting him ahead of Djokovic, but he's looked awfully good on the clay. And so he's going to get a lot of high kicking second serves and a lot of big first serves to his backhand. And he's going to get it tested on the clay. Yeah. Well, let's uh, a guy that's never been tested on clay is Rafael Nadal. He, he's lost to Robin Soderling. He's lost to Novak. I think he's 101 in two. Chris, is that right? I'm one and two. I'm most, uh, I'm amazing <laughs> equations in sport. Absolutely. <laughs> so just quickly, so I've talked to Jim Courier and Mary Carrillo, and every one of them, it's like, look, nothing is for sure, but the chances of him not walking out of there with his first 14th title is uh, is pretty slim. Now, would you agree? I mean, you have Novak, obviously, who could knock him off in the semis. Novak, on his game, I think, can match up with Rafa and potentially beat him on clay. And then you've got Fed up there. So let's say you had to say the, if you had to predict the percentages as far as which of those three players will win the title, I'm putting Roger in there because he's Roger. What would you say? No, I'm just not going to give, I mean, Roger <laughs> looked, looked great and the conditions were nice and quick and he's moving well and flowing well. And he's seems to be a uh, you know, much better federal than he was in Geneva, but I'm not sure I give Roger much of a chance here. And he's, yeah kind of counted himself out. Maybe that's just great tactics. Yeah. On his you know, like I said, for me, top, top half, it's Rafa number one and then Novak number two. And then down below, I mean, I, I like Sitsa Pass. And I also think, you know, Casper Root is. Yeah. I, I was going to mention him. Really, really good on clay. And, and he's got a great mentality. He's extremely fit, has some great wins coming in uh, this year already. He's another guy to watch for sure. Yeah, and, absolutely. And also, you know, Medvedev is a guy with all the racket skills. He's a flat hitter, but he's got a big serve, can win cheap points. If he gets his head together, he's the kind of guy who can make a run. I mean, it's not like he's playing a bunch of Grand Slam champions in the bottom half of the draw. So those are, those are all possibilities. Sure. And then let's get to it's a whole different um, story on the U.S. side on the, on the women's game. I was looking today. I was like, oh, oh my God. Uh, Coco, Serena, Danielle Collins. Serena plays Danielle Collins, which would be a heck of a match. Um, Kennan and Haley Baptiste, but then you go down the line. Sloan and Madison starting to play good tennis. Brady, Lepchenko. Chris, I don't know where it ends. I just wrote this big list just now, but um, why don't we just quickly, you want to talk about, well, let's talk about Ash Barty first. Is she healthy? I don't think she's healthy, no. I mean, she okay. definitely, the way she was being, you know, treated during that, that the opening match and, and, um, and she already has some arm problems, obviously, when she was, uh, you know, playing in Italy. And so I think she definitely is somebody who uh, isn't right physically 100% right now. Can she work her way through that with the extra day off between matches? Possibly. But you, you kind of feel like on clay courts, with all the contenders that there are and so much of the parity there is in women's tennis, you need to be really pretty close to 100% to, to make a full run at a Grand Slam these days. Yeah. Brett's out there. So, yeah, I mean, that's – but she has a wonderful game for clay. Um, Sabalenka, who's looked good, had a tough, tough match today. A lot of unforced errors. Got, you know, Serena's section of the draw is she's not playing great by any means. Doesn't look at her fittest. 
we were calling about her today, but you know, she's got a kind of an opening opportunity in that eight and can maybe face Sabalenka. She's got to get past Daniel Collins. She's playing very well. Absolutely. So there's a lot of opportunity for a lot of people here. And, and the American woman, you know, Coco Goff to me is a great clay court potential and great potential in general, but I like her game on clay, especially looks so good in Parma, moves so well on the surface and had won the French Open junior title, really understands the game well on the surface. And I, and I think she's rising in confidence. There's just a lot of interesting storylines on the women's side, as has been the case for, you know, two or three years now in terms of the many possibilities. I had Renee Stubbs on my show recently, another person that isn't afraid to speak her mind. She said, just like you just said, we don't need to rehash it. I don't know, 15 players, 20 players maybe that have a shot to win on the women's side. I don't, you know, I think 20 might be pushing it, but that's what, that's what she said. And I think you would agree, correct? Well, I mean, there's Ego Sviantec. She plays at the level she showed she could play last year and the way she played in Rome and, and these courts and these conditions and her mentality, it all seems to be a great fit. So, I mean, frankly, with Barty a little banged up, you know, Ega deserves to be the favorite, as, as, as crazy as that might sound, because she's only a one, one, one slam and won very few tournaments. Yeah. She has and... just a great, a great sort of uh, presence and mentality and, and, a, and really – the equation works on clay for her. that big Nadal-esque forehand that she has and her physicality and explosion in her game and, and just her, you know, great mindset. So, you know, she's, she's been practicing with Rafa too, which is a bad sign for all the women's field. If you ask me, <laughs> I didn't realize. Yeah, she practiced with How'd she step uh, that up? I imagine it was their, you know, team. <laughs> you know, um, definitely was uh, excited about, you know, she's that's her idol and I don't know how they arranged it, but I think she was, took it pretty seriously and was told us that she was trying to practice all her topics of conversation so she could fill the voids if they were any with Rafa and she, she had it all figured out. So Renee Stubbs, finally, I just want to end with Serena. Renee said as much as she wants to see Serena get to 24, tie Margaret court. Well, first of all, she said she doesn't even believe that's the record. Steffi has it at 21. That's a conversation for another day. Um, what, what Renee said, and it was surprising a little bit, um, I, I wasn't ready for it, but she said, look, I think at the end of the year, she is going to retire whether she got to 24 or not. The reason she said that is Serena has that peace of mind and you know, inside of her, it's not as important as it used to be. She has her family, Olympia. There's, there's a kind of waning not desire, but need to reach 24. And again, do you buy that? Or do you think she's just so determined she's going to, she's going to stay out there until she gets 24? I don't think it's been helpful to her to have that number so firmly lodged in her mind. Maybe it was a good driving force for her coming back from pregnancy. And maybe it was something that really uh, helped her get through her practice sessions and get ready for it. But I, I'm not so sure in terms of the mentality of it, having watched her in those four Grand Slam finals she's played since coming back that it's helped her. I think it's been more of a burden. Yeah. So maybe if she's talking to Renee or she's, you know, in her own team, sort of trying to play that down a little bit, I think that's a smart idea, which yeah. would be delighted to get there. Sure. But, you know, I, comparing across eras is very difficult. And yeah, you could argue, you know, some things in Margaret Court's favor as well in terms of records because of, of what was going on during that period of time. But I mean, it's, it was a different era. And I think it's not an artificial record. The number's there, but it's uh I don't think Serena should be defined by it in any way. And I, I have seen her play some matches where I've seen a little bit less of a, of a fire, but having watched her a couple of matches she's played here, she's, and today, you know, playing against Budonesco, she was uh, fighting for every point and scrapping and going after it and seemed to have a lot of that flame still light, lit inside of her. So she's a great champion, but at some point it has to end. And obviously she's not going to be happy if her body's banged up. And deep down, she knows she's got very little chance of winning a Grand Slam title. That's what she's out here for, whether it's 24 or not. She wants to be able to get to the end of one of these tournaments. Yeah. Well, Christopher, as always, I wanted to thank you for coming on. And I think the tournament, despite what's gone on with Naomi, which is going to continue to go on, but hopefully in a positive way, there's going to be some great tennis uh, at Roland Garros for the rest of the fortnight because yeah. there is just a uh, – there are a lot of great storylines and – there are a lot of uh, scenarios that I think people would like to see, and a lot of those scenarios include Roger Federer, 
and Serena Williams, and it's going to be fun to see how they do. So thanks yeah, again. I, mean, the, I think the, the tournament, the focus is not going to be on the tournament from here on in. And uh, I mean, Osaka was in the tournament. It wasn't like she wasn't in it. Yeah. So it wasn't, she started and played around. So it isn't like she was something com, coming completely from the outside. But oh, yeah. And I feel like uh, whenever you have Novak, Roger, and Rafa in the same half of a draw, which has <laughs> never happened in the Grand Slam before. <laughs> Yeah. It's already interesting right off the bat, and they're all still alive. And we'll yeah. see how Roger does against Chilich tomorrow. Thanks, Randy. Appreciate all right. It. Thank you. See you soon.